So this is about potential, and in particular, the potential of teenagers. And if you were to go onto the street and with a clipboard and say, what's the first thing that comes to your mind when I say teenager? And you would ask a bunch of adults, what would they say? They'd probably give you a list that might look something like this. They're lazy, they're immature, they're amoral, meaning they don't have morality, they don't you know, worry about morality. They are interested only in parties, iPods, video games, and Facebook, and I have to update this and add Pinterest on there, I think. They're ignorant, and they're irresponsible. Do you think you'd get responses like that if you went out on the street with a clipboard? But they are actually unique, powerful individuals, full of potential and in the prime of life. And so that's what I want to talk about today, the positive side of that. And I want to start by looking at this very interesting teenager. Well, he was a teenager at one time, Benjamin Franklin. He had a very interesting childhood, <clears throat> real character. He was born to a humble candle maker in Boston. At age eight, he entered grammar school. And this didn't work out so well, so he left within months. He didn't spend long in grammar school at all. But he was fond of reading, and he read the classics as a child. His dad had a, uh, they had a family library that was pretty well stocked. Age 10, he worked in his father's shop. But he didn't like the candle business. He wanted to be a sailor, see the world, and that sort of thing. So at age 12, he was apprenticed to his brother, a printer. So his dad doesn't know what to do with him. OK, go work for your brother. He disliked his brother's authority, so he ran away. Went to New York first on his way to Philadelphia. Age 16, he taught himself math from books. He taught himself to write well by reading periodicals, copying them as best as he, as he could from memory. Age 17, he made it to Philadelphia, flat broke, but quickly got a job as a printer. He went to work in London. And in his early 20s, he returned to America as a merchant secretary, with whose help he set up his own printing house and began printing a newspaper. Age 26, he began to publish Poor Richard's Almanac, which over the next 25 years spread his fame throughout the colonies and Europe. He designed an academy, which later became the University of Pennsylvania. He founded the American Philosophical Society for the Sciences. In 1748, he sold his business to devote himself to scientific research. He discovered electric charge, invented bifocals, the modern wood stove, the lightning rod, and other things. He became politically active at home and abroad. He played an essential role in the success of the American Revolution, and he was one of the five who wrote the Declaration of Independence. All this with no formal education. How did he do that? Was it his father's influence? They say his father was fond of reading and argumentation? Was it all the reading he did? Or was it that only here in America were common folk given a chance to show what they could do on their own without a master to push and order them about? Thomas Edison has a similar story. He attended school only three months, his only formal education. His mother homeschooled him from then on. When he was 12, he got a job selling newspapers, apples, and candy on a railroad. Age 15, still working for the railroad, he bought a used printing press, set it up in a baggage car, and started printing and selling his own newspaper on the train, the Weekly Herald. That year, he saved a small boy from being run over by the train. The boy's father was a station master, and in gratitude gave Thomas a job as a telegrapher. Tom used his salary to buy laboratory instruments. His first invention was an improved telegraph when he was 21. Then he went on to invent an improved telephone and the first phonograph at 31 and the first practical light bulb shortly thereafter. Laura Ingalls Wilder, another example. You know who that is? No. Yes? Who knows? Raise your hand. Okay. Wilder was the second of four daughters born to Caroline and Charles Ingalls. Her father was a true pioneer and dreamed of settling unknown territory. They traveled through thick woods, over barren prairies, through the swollen Mississippi, and over icy waters, all in their covered wagon. 
They moved from Missouri to Kansas to Wisconsin to Minnesota to Iowa and finally settled in DeSmet, South Dakota, where her father claimed a homestead. Her schooling was sporadic, and she worked as a seamstress until she earned her teaching certificate at the age of 15. She began teaching shortly thereafter. She married Almanza Wilder when she was 18, and they followed in the homesteading footsteps of her family. Her life, recorded in her well-known books, was a testament to the rugged individualism that characterized early America. It's the Little House in the Prairie series. What's the name of the series? No, I don't think it's called that. Anyway, um, a series of books uh, about her experience, and it covers her childhood and then also her time with, with Almanzo. Her daughter, Rose Wilder Lane, is considered one of the founders <coughs> of American libertarianism. Joan of Arc was 17 when, acting on a mystical vision, she led the French army to victory against the English. Two years later, she was burned for heresy by the English. She was 17. The Marquis de Lafayette was only 19 when he offered his assistance to our fledgling country, as was Nathan Hale when he gave his one life for that same cause. Alexander Hamilton was running a mercantile business at age 12 and wrote his first revolutionary pamphlet at 16. John Quincy Adams was ambassador to Russia at 14. Stonewall Jackson became a teacher and county constable at age 16. And it was not just a few of the leaders who started early. Alexis de Tocqueville in his 1839 work, Democracy in America, observed that in America there is strictly speaking no adolescence at the close of boyhood the man appears. Edward Eggleston drew similar conclusions in 1900s. In 1900, as he explained the reasons for American superiority in the world, he observed that first-generation Americans were still crippled by their habits of dependency learned in Europe, but American young people, freed from the European social system, were free to thrive. At the age of seven, he said, Americans begin growing up. Yeah, he said seven. And scientist Robert Epstein drew similar conclusions. Robert Epstein was the editor of Psychology Today for quite a while. He's a psychologist. And he wrote, in 1991, anthropologist Alice Schlegel of the University of Arizona and psychologist Herbert Berry III of the University of Pittsburgh reviewed research on teens in 186 pre-industrial societies. Among the important conclusions they drew about these societies, about 60% had no word for adolescence. Teens spent almost all their time with adults. Teens showed almost no signs of psychopathology, and antisocial behavior in young males was completely absent in more than half of these cultures, and extremely mild in cultures in which it did occur. So, this is something you've known for a long time. You can do a lot more than we give you credit for. Modern American teenagers are undervalued. Modern American teenagers are stymied by societal restrictions. Modern American teenagers underestimate themselves. And modern American teenagers are missing out on their full potential. In our culture, teens who want to reach their potential will find themselves swimming against the current. But it is possible. Oprah Winfrey got a job on the radio while still in high school and was co-anchoring the evening news at 19. Bill Gates earned $20,000 from his first programming venture at age 14. Michael Dell earned his first million by the time he was 19. Catherine Cook, who started this website called myyearbook.com, was 18 when she earned her, her first million. And Sean Belnick started uh, selling office furniture online and made a million dollars by 16, by age 16. Was he the one that invented the uh, swivel chair? I don't think so. I think he just sold it, but I'm not sure. And Richard Branson, you all know who he is? Is he that guy from the commercial? What commercial? That guy who says, no, not that one. Richard Branson uh, was dyslexic. And he had poor academic performance. He left school at 16 <coughs> years old. 
At 15, he had begun two business ventures, both of which failed, growing Christmas trees and raising parakeets. 16, old, 16 years old, he started his first successful business, a magazine called Student. He bought crates of records from a discounter and started a record selling business. He sold them out of the back of his car. By age 21, he had founded the Virgin Record Label, a recording studio and a record store in London. Virgin signed the Sex Pistols and the Culture Club. Do you know any of those, either of those uh, bands? I don't have any of the newer ones. Who's the Culture Club? It's, uh, Sex Pistols, yeah. Culture Club was uh, Boy George. You know Boy George? Oh, you gotta look him up on uh, YouTube. He founded, so Richard Branson now, not Boy George. Richard Branson founded Virgin Atlantic Airways in 1984 and Virgin Mobile in 1999, and lots of other companies with the Virgin name. Why did they, why did they call it Virgin? I don't know. He was the 236th richest person in 2008. How'd he do it? Well, a lot of people ask him that, and he often tells stories about his childhood, and his mother in particular. When he was seven, he was driving with his mom several miles from home. His mom stopped the car and asked if he could find his way home. He said, yes. She said, why don't you do it? And she let him out. And that's just one example. There's other examples. He said she was constantly challenging he and his sisters to do what they had the potential to do, what they had the capability of doing, and to push themselves, and not letting them get away with doing less than that. This is Virgin Galactic, one of his latest ventures uh, that hopes to take people into space. Uh, on his private airships, he's got a or spaceships. He's got a. He's building a spaceport in the southwest. It goes into orbit <coughs> around the Earth. Now, I'm not just talking here about just the the fact that you guys have more potential than your than you're living up to. I'm talking about a special potential of young people. Take, for example, the much cited relationship between age and scientific achievement. Dr. Satoshi Kanazawa studied this relationship. He says, anecdotal evidence abounds that artistic genius or productivity fades with age. Paul McCartney has not written a hit song in years and now spends his time painting. Orson Welles was a mere 26 when he wrote, produced, directed, and starred in Citizen Kane which many consider to be the greatest movie ever made. Anybody ever heard of Citizen Kane? No. Watched it? I've heard of it. But it's kind of, if you're a real film buff, <coughs> you might know about it. But he pioneered a lot of modern um, movie making techniques in that movie. The relationship between age and genius appears to be the same in science. It is often said that physics and mathematics are young men's games, or women's. And physicists and mathematicians tend to think they are over the hill at age 25. John von Neumann, putatively the most brilliant scientist who ever lived, used to assert brashly when he was young that mathematical powers decline after the age of 26. And only the benefits of experience conceal the decline, for a time anyway. James Watson made the greatest discovery in biology in the 20th century at the age of 25, winning the Nobel Prize for it, but has not made any other significant scientific contribution for the rest of his career. Nearly a quarter of all scientists make their most significant contribution in their career during the five years around age 30. Two thirds will have made their most significant contributions before their mid 30s, and 80% will have done so before their early 40s. In other words, I'm all washed up, but you definitely are not. And you don't have to be a straight A student. You don't have to have a great family upbringing. You just have to decide to swim against the current. And what is success anyway? Well, what kind of life do you want for yourself? What would make you really happy and fulfilled? Success is just succeeding at that. You may not care about Nobel Prizes or wealth or inventions, but it's not about success for the sake of success. It's just about improving your life. I can't tell you what should make you happy, 
but I do think we have a lot in common as human beings. Sensual pleasures like food, sex, comfort, and sleep bring some fulfillment, but that fulfillment tends to leak out quickly like water through our fingers. We can plan wisely to ensure that we get a steady supply of these things, and that makes sense. But there are things that can bring more lasting, and deeper fulfillment. Things like love, compassion, honor, moral rightness, freedom, overcoming obstacles, and responsibility. So figure out what makes you happy, whatever it is, and then choose goals that match. But whatever goals you choose, don't wait until you are grown up. Modern teen culture says that you are children without the power or responsibility to choose something better than immediate gratification, iPods, video games, and parties. But it hasn't always been that way, and it doesn't have to be that way now. You can choose this extended childhood, but you will miss out on deeper fulfillment. You can choose young adulthood, and your options will multiply, and so will your power and your freedom. So your choices, you can settle for teen culture or you can embrace young adulthood. Teen culture is extended childhood. Some now say that it runs into your 30s. Basically you're a child into your 30s. Or you can embrace young adulthood, which is natural maturity. You can spin your wheel with fake tasks, kind of like we do in school here, giving you fake simulations and stuff to do. Or you can do important things. You can waste your most productive and creative years, or you can be useful now. You can let your mind stagnate, or you can see your mind develop as it was meant to. You can miss out on your potential, or you can realize your full potential. You can live in a fantasy world, or you can live in the real world. You can play house, or you can enjoy real relationships. You can be owned and controlled like a child, or you can take ownership of your own life. You can pretend to be an adult, or you can be an adult. You can take the blue pill, or you can take the red pill. You can stay in the nest, or you can soar. The choice is yours. Thanks for listening.